Well, thanks for coming back this evening. We're grateful for your presence. We look forward to worshiping together. And we'll have more announcements toward the end of, end of services. In just a minute, we'll be standing together. Uh, John Scott will lead us in our opening prayer. Jacob Stout will be leading our singing. And BJ has the sermon this evening. If needed, Philip Smith will direct the thoughts for the Lord's Supper. And Bill Irwin has our closing prayer. Again, thank you so much for your presence. Let's stand together for opening prayer and please be seated after the prayer. Thank you, John. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before your throne. We thank you for this avenue of prayer that we have to be able to come to, to you and to lay our burdens on you. And we know that through our prayers we can Thank you for all the many blessings, Lord, that you give us. We pray that we never take them for granted, but give you eternal thanks for them. We thank you for this church here and this opportunity that we have to gather here to sing songs of praises unto you, to learn more about you, Lord, and to fellowship with one another in like precious faith. We are especially thankful for this country, Lord, that we can do this in such an open manner. We know that there are others in the world that do not have such a blessing, that they, are, they have to do it in secret and they are uh, punished for it if they are found. We thank you for all the many blessings, Lord, of your son and his sacrifice. We thank you for the love that was shown there on the cross and his blood shed for us. We pray now as we start our worship, Lord, that we reflect back on your son and we remove all worldly thoughts from us and reflect only on you. And we pray that our worship here this evening will be in strictest harmony with thy will. We also pray, Lord, for the courage to be able to take the things that we learn to go out into the world and teach others. We pray for those doors of open opportunity that we will have the courage to be able to take advantage of them and to spread your word in the world about us. We pray for BJ this evening that he will have a ready recollection of the words he has prepared to say to us and that we will have open ears, that we'll take in those things and apply them to our daily walks of lives as we see fit and that you've laid out for us. And we pray that we will always seek you, Lord, and to always seek your word and always do better. Forgive us of any of our shortcomings, Lord, and we know that we have many, but we know that it is through your grace and through your love that we can be forgiven for those. And it's all these things that we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good evening, everyone. I picked our first two songs that we're going to be singing tonight because they're songs that our children know. For those of us that have small children, or those that have had small children, we know how sometimes it's hard to get them to continue to pay attention during church and focus on what we're doing. So I wanted to sing some songs that they know that also have good meaning to us. So our first song tonight is number 267 in the red hymnal, Jesus Loves Me.
51. I'm happy today. to our evening worship. If you are a guest from our community, if you're tuned in online or here with us, we are so glad that you're here. Thank you for coming and making this a part of your day to worship our Creator together. And we're thankful that you are a part of this group tonight because we are a family here at Danville. We love one another and we serve one another and we want to help each other on our way to heaven. And if there's any way at all that we can help you in your walk with Jesus, whether it is to start your walk with Jesus or to pray with you or study with you, or serve you in some kind of a capacity, please let us know, and we would be more than happy to do that for you. Uh, several things before we get started. I know I need to keep it quick, because we finished our opening prayer, and Dane sat up and said, are we done? And so I think he's ready to go, so I better, better make sure that this isn't one of our longer ones. But I want to build up a couple of people, a couple of things, uh, before we begin our lesson this evening. Go ahead and turn over to Proverbs 5, uh, while I make some introductory comments. First of all, I want to, uh, I don't know what we'd do without Daron Stewart. I really don't. We were uh, just a couple of minutes uh, shy from service starting, and we had some, some miscommunication about who was running songs and putting songs up, and, and he jumped up and got right to it and put everything together for us. And Daron does so many things like that, and he doesn't like the, the public recognition, but he can take it out on me anyway. So uh, thank you, Daron, for all that you do. You do so much in the background, and we really appreciate it. I want to lift up the elders and their wives for a second. Harold made Loretta sit in her car for an hour this afternoon outside. At least he rolled the window down a little bit, which was great, but you know, I, I'm picking on Loretta. <laughs> Our elders are doing so much. They had meetings this afternoon, all afternoon, and they have meetings tonight after services, and then they've got meetings again all this next week. They do so much, guys. And th their wives do so much as a result and sacrifice so much to help with this congregation and the work of this church. I just wanted to build up our elders. You guys are always working, and you've had a busy day, and I just want to thank you for your work. And lastly, I just want to build up Daniel. What a great lesson we had this morning. That was exceptional. And Daniel and I spent some time this afternoon just talking about, you know, how many times many churches will define themselves by the things that they do not do, and we don't do things like the denominations do or like the world does, and that's what makes us who we are. 
And many times we have lost sight of what we are supposed to be doing. And so I really appreciated that lesson this morning and reminding us of what pure and undefiled religion looks like. If you're in Proverbs chapter 5, we just started a new series in the book of Proverbs going to wisdom literature to look at what God has to say in some of these books. And we are focusing primarily on the book of Proverbs. And last Sunday, we spent some time looking at the two primary themes that you're going to find in the book of Proverbs. You're going to find the path of wisdom and the path of folly. And understanding that wisdom is really synonymous with knowing God and understanding who God is. That wisdom comes from God and it is wisdom that leads to life. And it is a rejection of God and God's wisdom and the knowledge of God that leads to death in our lives. We then spent some time last Sunday night looking at the progression of the fool. Just like in Psalm 1, you have, you know, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the pathway of sinners or sit under the feet of scoffers, and you see that progression. The same thing happens with the fool throughout the book of Proverbs. You have the simple or the naive, who is one who is gullible spiritually and does not have a backbone spiritually, and that if one remains simple, they inherit folly, and that is the term fool that is used throughout the Proverbs, and that there are three different classifications of the fool that ultimately culminate in the mocker or the scoffer, and we spent some time talking about the profile of a fool. We're going to talk about an area of a lot of foolishness tonight in our culture, and we're going to jump right into the deep end as we discuss the things that the Proverbs has to teach us, and we want to begin by talking about sexual purity. It is no new news to us as we sit here tonight that when we look at the way that our culture has progressed, especially over the past even 50 years, 60 years, and starting with the sexual revolution, how much morality has changed amongst our culture when we view things of a sexual nature. Things that unanimously used to be looked upon as morally wrong are now preached and heralded as morally right, and those who oppose those things are morally wrong. The Proverbs are ancient wisdom that have a lot to say about sexual morality and sexual immorality and the dangers of sexual immorality. And this is one of those areas that I love to talk about. Not love because I get great satisfaction out of it, but because of my own background and my own history and the things that I struggled with in my life and now being out of that place in my life and the freedom that I found in Christ and in my marriage, recognizing what so many people are missing and love to discuss this topic, especially with young men who are struggling with sexual purity. Proverbs chapter 5, we can look to many places in the Proverbs to talk about sexual purity. But Proverbs chapter 5 is the very first thing I ever read when I'm sitting down and talking with another young man who is struggling with pornographic addiction or other kinds of sexual impurity. Because this chapter is the only place we are going to be tonight. We are not going to turn to any other text. Everything that we need to discuss is going to be found right here in this chapter. And chapter 5 really can be broken down into three sections. The first section, as we're going to see, is going to be the warning. The warning against sexual immorality and where it will lead to. And it will piggyback then in verses 7 through 14 talking about the cost of one who does not listen to the warning and the one who does not establish good boundaries. And then finally will culminate in the choice that is laid before us. That God has given us a beautiful and righteous and godly pathway in which to practice our sexual you know, urges and the things that God has given us in our lives which are godly and beautiful, or we can make a choice which will ultimately lead in our destruction and our downfall. And so let's go ahead and read through this text, and let's begin in verse 1 and go down through verse 6, and we will approach this in each segment. We want to first look at the warning and break down this warning together. Let's begin in verse 1. It says, My son... Be attentive to my wisdom and incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion 
and your lips may guard knowledge. For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path to Sheol, and she does not ponder the path of life, her ways wander, and she does not know it. We want to begin by looking very intently at verse 1 and verse 2, which could easily be skipped over to try to go to the, quote, substance that begins in verse 3. But there's something very important that we need to understand this passage is founded upon and what sexual purity, discussions regarding sexual purity need to be founded upon before we have any other discussions. He says, my son, be attentive to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding that you may keep discretion. Does anyone else's Bibles have a different version there than discretion? that you may keep good discernment, is what yours might say. This idea of discretion, what we want to begin talking about this evening, is setting up the right boundaries. When you think about someone that has good discretion or poor discretion, what you're thinking about is someone that has good judgment or bad judgment, regardless of the intent of their hearts. They might very simply not have good discretion despite the fact that they have good intentions, right? Someone perhaps might have good intentions. They want to take the shortcut to get home, but they don't have good discretion because walking down the middle of the dark alley at 3 o'clock in the morning is probably not the wisest choice for someone to make. Good intention, bad judgment. Whenever it comes to sexual purity, what we need to recognize and what we see so many times is the reason that people fall is because it all began with not having the correct boundaries set up. We're not making judgments about someone's heart. We're making judgments about someone's lack of judgment, not setting up the correct boundaries. Because when you have poor judgment, when you have poor boundaries, that is often when you find yourself in a position in which you can be tempted to compromise your morals or your ethics. Boundaries are something that every single one of us need to have, especially in our marriages. Kylie and I have some very, very specific rules when it comes to our marriage and our relationship with other individuals. You know, I do not have friends who are primarily, you know, females that are not engaged with Kylie that are mutual friends. You know, I don't just have people that I'm friends with and build a relationship with that she doesn't know about. That's just not something that is appropriate in our lives. That is a boundary that we have set. And there's lots of other boundaries that we've set as well. There are boundaries regarding, you know, who I take with me in my car. Back when we were doing the youth devos all the time and I was carting people around, it never failed that, you know, there'd be a whole bunch of teens that needed a ride and I was happy to give people a ride, but my first step was always, we take the girl home first. Doesn't matter if she lives next door because I'm going to drive an hour the other direction to make sure that a boy is dropped off at the end to make sure I'm not alone with another young woman in my car because that's just not a good boundary. Maybe not sinful, but it's certainly not good judgment. And so many things begin with this way. It's the young man who thinks that I can have a smartphone at 12 or the parents who think their young man can have a smartphone at 12 and have full internet access and no boundaries whatsoever and no accountability whatsoever and think, well, he's just a good young man. I love my sweet Johnny and he's going to make good choices. You cannot make decisions like that and expect your children to not fall. There need to be better boundaries that are set up in our lives because even though we might have good intentions, if we have bad boundaries, we're going to find ourselves in a place where we are very clearly and very quickly going to be compromised. And not just because it's something that we want, but as you look in the text, it is something that we are trapped and enticed to do. Look at the text again. 
It says here, the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. In other words, the way it is presented is in a way that is good and beautiful and attractive and exciting. And isn't that everything that sexual immorality is painted to be in our culture? That it is good and beautiful and right and exciting and natural, so much to the point that if you are sexually pure, you are actually mocked by the scoffers for being so. If you practice sexual purity and you're a young man, you are mocked by your friends as being a prude or being a virgin or all these different kinds of things. And that, that's not the good thing. The good thing, the natural thing, is to be loose with our bodies. And that's what, that's what we're made to be, much like the Corinthians argument was about how the stomach is made for food. And Paul had to say the body is not meant for sexual immorality. And yet that's the way that our culture views things. And such a message, especially to young people who are still developing in their bodies and in their minds and in their brains, and in their hearts, what they believe and what they don't believe. This can be a very enticing message to both young men and to young women as well. And it's not just to those who are young. It's especially to those who are young. But this is to all of us who are not weary and understand and use wisdom to see the end of a thing, our definition of wisdom. Because to see the end of a thing, though they promise that this is good and beautiful and smooth, the end is bitter as wormwood and sharp as a two-edged sword. As a matter of fact, her feet go down to death. This would be the adulteress. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. And the worst part is she does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander. She does not even know it. And isn't that the culture that we live in today? They do not even know that the things that they're doing are wrong. They don't know. There is an ignorance to the sexual immorality that is taking place all around us, and that makes it even more difficult because no one else sees this as wrong, and so maybe I'm the one who's wrong about this being wrong. And so these warnings are so perfectly clear from Solomon to his sons, and he's telling them, yes, this is the promise, but you need to recognize that it is an empty promise. And the only direction this is going to take you is to spiritual death and even physical destruction as we're going to see in this passage if you listen to the voice of those who are enticing you. And this is going to bring us to our second point tonight. This is going to bring us to the cost. Let's read verses 7 through 14 together, and we want to break this down and look at different elements of what Solomon has to say here. Beginning in verse 7, he writes and says, And now, O sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. I actually want to pause there before we read any more. He says, you keep your way far from her and don't even go near the door of her house. Don't even walk down the same street that her house is on. Why would Solomon tell his sons this? Why would he tell them, don't even go near her house? Don't even walk down the same street that her house is in. Have you ever heard the expression, if you play with fire, <laughs> what's going to happen? You're going to get burned. And yet, how many times do we play with sin and expect ourselves not to fall? We get as close to the line as we possibly can and think that we're strong enough, and certainly we aren't going to fall, and the next thing you know, we are falling for the very thing we said we wouldn't do. Why? Because we have set ourselves up for failure. This goes right back to the discussion about setting up the correct and the right boundaries in our lives. Because if we do not have the right boundaries that are set up, Solomon returns to this notion, if you do not have the right boundaries set up, it's not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And if I play this game of trying to get as close to sin as possible without actually sinning, at some point you are going to fall. And that's the language Solomon uses. 
He says, do not set yourself up for failure. You stay as far away from her as possible, lest you give. It's a connection he makes. If you do not, the more you continue to dwell on this and think on this and, and have it be a possibility, at some point you're going to act on it. You've got to put it out of your life. You've got to put it out of your mind. You've got to make it to the point where it's not even possible if you wanted to. This is one of the, the things that we have got to understand when it comes to making pure decisions when it comes to our bodies. If you wait until the moment in which you are tempted in order to try to say no and be prepared ahead of time, there is a great likelihood that you are going to fall and make some very great mistakes. Do you remember when Cain was first tempted to kill his brother and the Lord comes to Cain and he tells him sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but then he says, you must, what does he say? Master over it. My friends, the time to master over sin is before it's mastered over you. The time to master over sin is before it's ever mastered over you. And when we make decisions, when we are in our sober mind and sober thinking and say, I'm going to set these parameters in order so that way this is not even a possibility. I'm going to set these boundaries up so that way this is not even a temptation in my life. That is when we are going to find it so much easier for us to walk the way that God has called for us to walk. We're making decisions in our sobriety beforehand so that way we are not even tempted when the time could come. But the time will come. There will be temptations. And when that comes, we need to remember the cost that's associated with giving in to temptation, especially sexual immorality. Uh, Harakui... Murakami, did I say that right? I am not good at pronouncing uh, uh, names like this, but I really, really thought this statement from him encapsulates everything that the proverb writer, what Solomon is trying to say in the next following verses. It takes years to build up. It takes moments to destroy. That is true with anything in life, by the way. If you want to build a house, that's going to take you months, isn't it? and pouring the foundation, and, and, and framing the house, and drywall, and electrical, and plumbing, and calling Jacob Stout for roofing, and all those kinds of things, right? And it's going to take you months, but a tornado comes through, or someone leaves the stove on, and what can happen in a matter of moments to that house that took months to build? In just a moment, it's destroyed. How long does it take to grow one of the beautiful flowers that's out there in the garden? And you, 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 you plant it, and it, it's watered, and the seed has to bud and grow, and it blooms, and then all it takes is Dane walking by and going, and popping it out of the ground, and in a second, it's done. This is the nature of life that we live in. It takes years to build, but only moments to destroy. And this is what Solomon wants us to understand when it comes to sexual immorality, is the kinds of things it takes years to build, but seconds to destroy in our lives. Look at what he says in verse 9 lest you give your honor to others. Let me ask you this question. How long does it take to build a good reputation in your life? How long does it take to build a good reputation? It takes a tremendous amount of time, doesn't it? Because you have to have experience and contact with others and show proven character over time. And over a period of years, you can develop a good reputation. But you make one mistake, one mistake, and you have an affair. Or you make a mistake, and it comes out that you have all kinds of pornography on your devices, and it's brought to a public nature. What happens to your reputation that you've taken years to build? It's the sad reality. But I know brethren who were gospel preachers who spent years and years of their lives building a good reputation, doing good work for the Lord, and despite having good intentions, had very poor boundaries and ended up making a very serious mistake. 
And thank God, in those cases, at least that I know of, there was reconciliation on both parties. But you know what was not replaced? Is the reputation and everyone that was involved in those situations. Trust was broken. And as a result, there were consequences because of not having the right boundaries and walking up to that door. And you give your years to the merciless. Verse 9. How long does it take to build a good marriage? How long does it take to get to know your spouse? I'm sure there are some of you who have been in this room and married a considerable amount of time longer than I have, and you would say you're still getting to know your spouse. And you're still working on your marriage. It takes years to build trust and to build intimacy in a marriage. And yet, a husband or a wife, without having the right boundaries and making a mistake, can absolutely destroy years and years of intimacy and trust and vulnerability because of a decision that is made. And it will take many, many, many more years to even try to repair the damage that was done as a result. Verse 10, Lest strangers take fill of your strength, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. We can get as specific as we want with the applications of this, but I'm just going to say this. Sexual immorality comes at a great cost. I say this all the time, no pornography is free. And what I mean by that is, yes, there is pornography that you can access free of charge all over the place, but it always comes at a tremendous cost, a tremendous cost. And you start to look at what has happened to individuals who have not listened, who have not given in to, or who have given in to their fleshly desires. And as a result, they find themselves in a place where it has damaged them in their work, it has damaged them financially, it has damaged them in every capacity. And their years that could have been spent in their strength with their children, growing a family, instead are spent alone, taken by strangers. And so, verse 11, at the end of your life, you groan. When your flesh and your body are consumed. I think there is some very physical uh, applications of this, not just spiritual. There are great physical costs that come with sexual promiscuity, aren't there? And I think that is exactly what Solomon had in mind when he says, at the end of your life, when your flesh and your body are consumed, there are consequences to our actions, and sometimes they come even in our own physical bodies. And he goes on to say, how I hated discipline, and my heart despised reproof. Doesn't this take us back to the fool? The one who despised the knowledge of God, the one who mocked at wisdom, and therefore wisdom would laugh at them in return. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. And much like in the end of Proverbs chapter 1, who is the one to blame for being in utter destruction and ruin as a result? Yourself. Yourself. You have no one to blame but yourself for not listening for not setting up the right boundaries, for not taking this seriously, for thinking it wouldn't cost you, for thinking you could get away with it, for thinking it would be worth it, and you lose everything. And at that point, it's too late. There's no coming back. Solomon paints a very bleak picture here, doesn't he? And it would be easy to see and understand why when you look at the Corinthian books, some of them came to the conclusion, it's better for a man not even to touch a woman right? Understanding the dangers associated with this and saying, we might as well just check out. And Paul had to deal with that too and say, no, 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 I'm not saying that, especially to those of you who are married. And that's the direction that Solomon's going to go with this because Solomon is trying not to scare us regarding intimacy. He's going to paint a biblical picture of what God has always had in mind and had intended from the start. 
And we are going to be given a choice. And that choice begins in verse 15. Where he says, drink water from your own cistern. And flowing water from your own well. This is a metaphor. And most of us are adults in here. And I think we can understand that this is a metaphor of the union in a marriage. And the intimacy physically that is involved in a marriage. And I want you to look at, specifically, the very next verse. Verse 16. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. One of the things that I try to hammer so hard when talking to young men who have the exact same experiences and have fall into the same pitfalls that I have in my life, is understanding the absolute absurd hypocrisy of those who look at pornographic things and pursue sexual immorality. I want you to look at what he said. He said, drink water from your own cistern. And this is an allusion to marriage and where God wants us to engage in sexual intimacy out of verse 15. But then he asked the question, should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets? And I'll usually ask young men this. I'll ask them something to the effect if they're married or if they have a fiancé or a girlfriend. I'll be like, how angry would you be if while you were surfing things you should not be looking for online, you found that your wife had videos of herself on the internet for others to view of her own body? How would that make you feel? And their response immediately is, you know, betrayed and angry and, and disgusted and shocked and all these things. And I'm like, so let me get this straight. You're upset about that because this is your wife. She belongs to you alone, but you're okay with coming over here and drinking water out of someone else as well. This is for yourself alone, but you're okay with coming over here and having a little bit of something to drink. Do you see the hypocrisy in what Solomon is trying to bring out here? We would never, ever share the vulnerable, beautiful, intimate union that we have in our marriage with someone else. And yet, why are we so willing to do that ourselves? Let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. And what he goes on to say is the beautiful union of how God has designed intimacy in our lives. Begin in verse 18. He says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth, a loving deer, a graceful doe, and let her breast fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always with her love. This language is very rare in the way it speaks of intimacy in Scripture. Primarily, it is going to be found in Song of Solomon. Again, wisdom literature and part of the books of poetry. But this language is used to emphasize something that we have to recognize and understand. And here we're going to take a little bit of a deviation. One of the things that I have found most common, whenever I sit down and talk with someone who is struggling with sexual immorality, uh, one of my very first questions to them is I ask them, how was sexuality discussed and taught in your home? You want to know what the number one answer is that I've, I've received from about 95% of those I talk to? Guess what the answer is? It wasn't. That it was this taboo subject that was never discussed, that was never taught, and that was never painted a biblical and godly vision of what God had in mind, and so it was just something that we did not talk about. In fact, it was wrong. It was painted as dirty and wrong and disgusting. And yet, that's not God's view of intimacy. And my friends, when we do not teach our children a godly perspective and a godly view of these things at an age-appropriate level as they grow, then what's going to happen is where are they going to learn answers for these things and the things that they're feeling? They're going to learn answers from the world, and you think they're going to learn a godly view of sex when they look at the world? We set our own children up for failure when we do not teach them the beauty and the joy of how God has designed the marriage union. 
Solomon holds back no words here, and he says, you be intoxicated with your wife. It's as though you're drunk on her love, and there are so many bad country songs that use that illustration all the time and talk about that. But I love the poetic nature of what Solomon is saying. He's saying, you be fully invested in your wife. There are no restrictions. You just, you enjoy your spouse. You guys give each other fully to one another. You are completely vulnerable. You are completely transparent. You hold nothing back from each other. And it is exclusive to you and your spouse alone. And here's what's amazing. When you practice monogamy in that sense, in sexual fidelity, guess what? Marriages are healthier. Your union is healthier. Your body is healthier. Your mind is healthier. And these are all scientifically proven facts. And it's like shocking that when we honor God and do things God's way, amazingly, it turns out better for us in our life. Isn't that what we found in our very first study that wisdom leads to life, not just ultimately, but in here in this life as well? My friends, enjoy your marriage. Enjoy your husband and your wife. Continue to court them. Continue to chase after them. Continue to love them. And yes, I understand that marriages don't stay in the honeymoon stage and, and kids come, and I understand all of that very clearly. But that never means that we should ever stop pursuing our spouse. Because it's when we stop pursuing our spouse that often Satan sticks his foot in the door. And it leads to something far worse. In question, in turn, the choice that we're also given is a rhetorical one. Why should you be intoxicated, my son, with a forbidden woman and embrace the bosom of an adulteress? It makes no sense. After everything, all of the warnings and the costs, why would you ever fill yourself up with something that you knew was going to kill you and destroy you? Why would you do that? Why would you pursue something that is going to bring you to utter ruin and does not provide what it is you are actually truly seeking and what God has designed from the very beginning? And make no mistake, the choices that we make, though perhaps we might be able to keep them hidden from others, nothing is hidden from the eyes of Jehovah. Verse 21 teaches, for a man's ways are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all of his paths. Many turn a blind eye to the warning and turn a blind eye to the cost because they believe that they can escape the cost. While you might be able to keep an affair hidden for your whole life, while you might be able to keep pornographic addiction hidden from those that are around you, Nothing is hidden from the eyes of God. And if I come into this place and I offer prayers and fake worship to God and pretend like my heart is given to Him, knowing full and well that I am engaged in activity and in actions and in things that are absolutely deplorable and an abomination to God, do not think for a second that God will see you as righteous simply because other people do. We will be judged when we stand before Jesus Christ, for every action, every thought, and God sees all that we do. And here's the irony of it all. If you find yourself and we find ourselves caught up in sexual immorality, a lot of people pursue this as a form of freedom. It's liberation, right, is the language that's often used. It's actually quite the opposite. Verse 22, the iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He's tied himself up. This is the nature of addiction, especially in our lives. People look to things for freedom, and the very things they look to for freedom become the very things that they become enslaved to in their lives. People will look to alcohol for freedom, and as a result, often become enslaved to it. People look to drug use and euphoria and high for freedom, 
and it ends up becoming the very thing that they are enslaved to in their lives. And in the same way, pornographic addiction, sexual addiction, while people pursue it thinking it will bring them freedom, is going to bring them great slavery in their lives. And I know what I'm talking about. Because that's my life. That's what was my life for so, so long. You know, it's interesting, you look at brain scans and MRIs of those who are in the middle of pornographic addiction and people who are on cocaine, you know what, they're almost identical. The different things that are going on in the brain, the different things that are happening within the body, we as a culture have really diminished the consequences and the realities spiritually, biologically, physically, everything, relationally, of sexual immorality. Because it's all around us in our culture. We need to hold fast and recognize just how dangerous it is despite what the culture around us tells us. Because if we don't, verse 23, another one of those times when God calls us stupid. He dies for lack of discipline. And because of his great stupidity, he is led astray. The lesson invitation tonight is very simple. It's right up on the screen. Don't be stupid. Do not do something that is going to cost you everything you've spent years building for in your life. It's not worth it. Satan promises freedom. Satan promises release. Satan promises honor and respect and all of these things, but it is a lie. It is a trap. We need to heed the warnings and we need to set the right boundaries and stay as far away from it as possible because if we do not, do not fool yourself. We will fall and great will be our fall and we will only have ourselves to blame. We have a choice to make. God has designed a beautiful, wonderful union in marriage and we can pursue that union and pursue the things that God has naturally built within us that are good and righteous and loving things. But it needs to be God's way. Because when we deviate from that, that is when we are going to find ourselves in a mess of trouble in our lives. I know that tonight I have spoken in some very graphic terms. I've tried to use as much age-appropriate language as possible, especially with kids and adults all in here. But these are things that we need to discuss. These are things that we need to adhere to. This is returning to the ancient past, the ancient wisdom that is penned from us from thousands of years ago. And the same things we read about that people were struggling with then, or guess what? The same things we're still struggling with now. And I want you to know, if you're here tonight, if this is something you're struggling with, I understand the guilt and the shame associated with it, but I'm going to tell you right now, if you continue to try to do it alone, you will not get better. You will not overcome. I would, I would just beg you to just expose that in your life. I know it's embarrassing. I know it's terrifying. But if it's something that you need to make right, don't walk away from this building without doing that. And I'll tell you right now, I'm going to be the last person to judge you. I'm going to be the first person to hold your hand through this process and try to help lead you to a better place. Because there is freedom on the other side. And there's something far better for you. And so that's my first invitation tonight. If you're here and you need to make your life right with Christ, and you have been bound up in sexual immorality, then make that known and we'll do everything we can to help you and restore you in your relationship with Jesus. But if you're here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel, maybe this is one of those things that you're worried about that has a hold on you and that's why you haven't made the decision yet. You've got a building full of Christians here that have been tempted in all the same ways you have and that are going to be here to support you and love you and build you up. Don't allow the sin of which Jesus is the only antidote to take away and heal to prevent you from coming to him. Obey the gospel. Repent of your sins. Be buried with him in baptism. You will rise to walk in the newness of life, being forgiven all of your sins and given a relationship with God through the Holy Spirit to produce the fruits of the Spirit and walk in step with the Spirit. Why don't you come forward now as we stand and sing the song of encouragement.
think about how Jesus loves us and how we're happy because of the sacrifice that he made for us. In our last song, we sing, asking God to mold us to his will. But then as we sing this song, number 161, we're specifically focusing on the pain, suffering, and embarrassment that Jesus went through for us, but yet he became, or came out of that victorious so that we might have a hope of salvation. Number 161, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Man. This morning we talked about change, about how the blood of Christ changes us, and I, I know I can personally resonate with BJ's lesson tonight. And uh, for those who were not here this morning, it is still the first day of the week. It is still a time where we are gathered together, and it is our opportunity to be able to partake with you, to remember Christ's sacrifice, so that we might have hope that we can change. And so as we gather around this table once again, let us go to God in prayer as we think back to that body and that blood that was shed on the cross so that we might have a hope to be able to unshackle ourselves from the change of sin. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, as we come before the table once again, we thank you for your son, for the body that was broken on the cross on our behalf, for a debt that we could never hope to pay. We ask that you would be with those who are partaking of the bread this evening, that you would clear their mind, that we might all focus together in unison on that body that was broken on our behalf. Not because of <clears throat> anything he had done, but because of what we had done. And because of that body, we have hope to be reunited with you, to repair that relationship that we could not mend ourselves because of your love and your grace and your undying, unyielding sacrifice that you would put that body on a cross on our behalf. We thank you for that. And it is in the name of the one who broke his body for our sake 
We pray this prayer, amen. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine as well. Father, the night before your son went to the cross for us, he prayed to you and said, Father, if it be your will, please let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thine be done. We understand what it took to go to the cross, what it took to spill that blood. For every thorn that dug into his brow, for every stripe that was laid across his back, was payment for our sins and our iniquities. And it was through that blood that we were able to, to look to the cross and have hope. We are grateful for the, the blood that washes over the altar, covers our sins from you, O oh Lord. The price that was paid is one that we could never hope to pay back, but we ask that as we partake of the cup this evening, that we would be grateful, we would think on the implications of that blood and what a wonderful blessing of love and selfless sacrifice it is that we can have a hope of eternity with you because of that blood that was shed on that cross that day. It is in the name of the one who spilt it for us. We pray this prayer. Amen. Before Charlie comes and pushes me off the stage. <laughs> we also have an opportunity to uh, follow an example that we have in the New Testament uh, where Christians would gather together and set aside that which they had been blessed with in order that the work of the church might continue. And as uh, such an example is what we have to, to go off of, the elders have seen fit that we set aside this time to, to do so and to, to remember that and to think about, uh, think about our blessings. Think about where we are, where we're going to be going this week as far as how we can help serve the community around us, how we can serve and love one another as a family, as we so often say here. And so as we think on those blessings that God has made us not owners of, but stewards of, let us think on these things. And for those who need to lay by and store as you have purposed in your heart, there is a basket, of course, in the back. Not a solicitation from our visitors, but an opportunity for us to serve one another as members here of the congregation. So let's go to prayer once more for the thank being thankfulness to our Father. Father, we have so many blessings that we do not deserve. We have so many blessings that you've showered down upon your children that we so often take for granted. But as we look to, to, to think about these things, as we think about how we can better serve you, how we can be more effective in your kingdom. We ask that we would remember that we are but caretakers of those blessings. And that it is not a it is not something that we get transactionally, but it is something that you pour out freely upon your children. And that we are but custodians of such things. We ask that we would remember that as we go throughout this week, that we are not working for ourselves, we're not working for our bank accounts, we're working for you. We are working to reflect you to others around us in our actions, in our deeds, how we treat others, how we spend our money, and all things. And so we thank you for the opportunity to be able to take those talents and serve you as best we can. We ask that we would always take that thought with the seriousness that it deserves. We thank you for the elders here, for the hard work that they, they do with your flock and trying to reach the community around us. We ask that you would give them the wisdom, you would give them the guidance, and you would give them discernment to be able to take the blessings that we gather here and to use them fruitfully and benefit, uh, beneficially to your kingdom. But above all things, Father, we thank you for the greatest gift, which is that your son came to earth and died on our behalf that we can spend together in eternity as a family, not just here on this plane, but in the next. In all these things, we are grateful and we thank you in the name of the Son. Amen. Well, thanks again, you all, for your presence tonight. You know, I missed a couple of Sundays, even last Wednesday, and it was like flashbacks of COVID a little bit. And it's just good to be here. Very good to be here. It's a great blessing, so let's never take that for granted. 